And so maybe you're going, all right, single and secure, what's up with that? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married, or why are we talking about this category of life? Well, what I really believe is I believe that the majority of relationship problems sometimes boil down to individual issues. And so I don't think this is just a collection of talks for people that are single. I think it's a collection of talks for everybody in the room and everybody online. I believe that you're born single, you're going to die single, you're going to stand before a righteous God single, and I hope that you lived your life in all seasons of life single and secure, satisfied in Jesus. And sort of a tagline that we have been kind of saying the last few weeks, I just want to keep it going, is that if you want to end married and happy, start single and secure. And I think this is back to the basics for many of us. And so today we are in part three of this collection. Uh, I kicked off week one talking about this idea of don't believe the lie, that you need a spouse to produce eternal security or produce produce inner security. No, you don't. Jesus does that. Uh, Last week, I preached a message. If you haven't heard it, you need to go get it. It's for everybody entitled, Know Your Worth. Stop giving discounts. Add tax. (laughs) And continue to appreciate. And uh, today, I want to look at 1 Peter 2, verse 9. I'm going to use this as a foundational text today. And then uh, I've got some things I want to share on my heart. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now, someone say, but now. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now, someone say, but now. But now you have received mercy. Uh, last year, we did an entire collection of talks on First Peter, the book of First Peter, entitled Endure. And so a lot of us who have been on the journey of Voo Church, we have a lot of context around the book of First Peter, but uh, he's writing in a time when people are facing persecution and challenges, and he's really encouraging the church to endure and not give up and be reminded who they are. And I grew up in church. Uh, I've been in church since I was uh, a little boy. And these days, I tend to preach out of the New International Version, or the English Standard Version. But sometimes there's certain scriptures that I learned as a little boy from the, the, the old school passages, you know, like the King James Version. And I just wanted to read one little, little verse uh, from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, out of the King James Version, because there's, there's, there's a little phrase that I think I want to use as my title today. This is what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 in the King James Version. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Watch this a peculiar people. Look at your neighbor and say, you are peculiar. And so we've talked about not believing the lie. We've talked about knowing your worth. And today, just for all of us in this room, I want to remind you to be peculiar. Be peculiar is my title, and I want to preach from that today. Would you pray with me, Lord? We thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you brought us here today. We thank you that you're encouraging us even right now as we get around your people and as we get into your presence. So, Lord, I pray that you'd lift heads today, that you encourage people, that you give us a vision, Lord, for the life that you designed and developed for us. Help us to walk in faith today. We love you. We praise you. We thank you in advance for all that you are doing and you're going to do. And if you agree with that prayer, All of God's people said? All of God's people said? Come on, Voo Church, make a little bit of noise if you believe it today. I have been following Jesus, as I said, really since I was a young boy, but it was at 17 years of age, which I thought was so cool today here at Somi, having Kevin uh, come and encourage us at 17 years of age. Um, Just cool to see teenagers get on fire for Jesus and That really was my story. At 17 years of age, I had an encounter with the living God. I've talked about it many times here from this platform, but my whole life was changed from the inside out. And um, as I've been following Jesus, I I, I suppose that as I've grown and as I've matured, um, every once in a while, I kind of have a bone to pick with, with culture and with society. It's not traditionally the way that I preach. It's not really the way that I go after it. Uh, I think that we're called to carry light into darkness. I think we're called to um, really follow Jesus and the love of Jesus changes people from the inside out. But, but every once in a while, I kind of just get a little annoyed. And I thought I would just talk about a couple of my annoyances for a moment, just with what society tends to do sometimes. Um, 
Have you ever noticed that when it comes to media or when it comes to society, that whenever they're depicting a Christian, they tend to make us look strange, weird, prude. Like in any movie, wherever there's a pastor, it's like, you don't want to be that guy. He's always like nerdy. He's got a sweater vest on like this. <laughs> it's almost like they're not in touch with, with reality. I think many times what, what happens in cultures is that there's a thing called hard power and soft power. We preached about it in the Mindsets Collection, but hard power is like the police force. They force you to do something. But more often than not, the things that come against us are not hard power. It's more often than not, it's, it's soft power. It's ideas, it's, it's concepts, it's threads, it's media that begins to spread lies into us and begins to depict things. For instance, if you watch almost any modern-day sitcom today or any almost modern-day television show, what you'll notice over and over again is there's a repeat, and the repeat is is that the father character typically is lazy, dumb, and slow. Over and over again, the father is completely destroyed in culture, and he's made to look like a dope. And if we're not careful, what will happen is we'll begin to believe the lies the culture is sharing. But we need to understand that there is soft power that wants to destroy faith and wants to destroy the family. And what happens to so many of us is that we begin to watch this thing over and over and over again, and we begin to believe the lies of the culture. I remember when I first got married, there was all these stats going on around about like marriage being boring and the same thing. It kind of always like in the shows, the marriage is always like struggling and not very fun. And the surveys are like, yeah, it's just, it's slow and your adventure stops. And I was like, yo, when I get married, bro, come to my house because I'm gonna throw your survey off. You know, like (laughs) I was bound to say marriage is awesome. Marriage is epic. I want to showcase the beauty, the blessing, the wonder of marriage. Why? Because I actually believe that any season with Jesus is a wild adventure. It is exciting. It is fun. Single, married, with Jesus, you are on an adventure. And what we have to learn over and over again, and what I'm discovering as I get older, is that when light invades the night, the darkness has two options. The darkness can either bow and let the light expose the lies for what it is, or the darkness fights like hell to extinguish the light. And we as a church, the more the culture lies, the more we have decided that we are going to go into the night. We're going to continue to push back and we're going to continue to showcase the truth of God's word and let it illuminate the darkness. I don't think being a dad is boring. I don't think being a Christian is boring. I don't think being married is boring. I don't think being single following Jesus is boring. We're not weird. We're not strange according to culture standards. No, we actually have a revelation of who he's called us to be. You are called to stand out. You're called to be different. Dr. Seuss said it this way. He says, why fit in when you were born to stand out? Uh, I love all the Dr. Seuss books, but it seems like the world has tried to pay attention to what Dr. Seuss has said. But have you noticed that the world has never, ever celebrated individuality more than it does right now? Everything is curated. Everything is for the individual. It's, it's, it's curated food. It's, it's curated entertainment. It's curated music, curated movies, curated news. That's scary. Um, we, we just get everything fit and formed right to us. But with all of this fashion and with all of this entertainment, with all of our politics and with all of our education, it seems more than ever that people don't stand out. People just look the same. People just look the same. What if I told you that it's not your fleshly individuality that makes you stand out, but rather it's your spiritual identity? What if you could learn today that what separates you from the pack, what separates you from the crowd is not what you're wearing on the outside, but rather who you are on the inside? I think when it comes to this area of being single, I think we're all many times trying to stand out. Yo, if you just look like everybody else, how is anybody ever going to see you for who you really are? I love what we're reading here today in 1 Peter because Peter is reminding the church that when you have been saved by Jesus, you have been called out of the darkness and into the light. 
He says that you have been called out of the lies and into the truth. And he says this little phrase. He says, you are a peculiar people. And I just looked up the word peculiar because I want you to get this in your heart today because this is for all the believers, but especially those of us that are single. Peculiar means strange, odd, uncommon, unusual, distinctive in nature or character from others. I want to remind you, especially to those that are single in this room, be peculiar. This is how you stand out. This is actually what God does to you. He calls you out of the crowd. You don't look like everybody else. You don't look like all of society. You're not to fall into the lies of what culture is telling you. You are called to come out of the crowd. You are not a part of the majority. You are the minority. You are peculiar. And at times, you look a little odd. At times, you seem a little bit strange. At times, your character does not line up with the character of the culture. And I think one of the most potent and practical ways that the world ought to be able to see our peculiarity is when it comes to relationships. Our friendships should be peculiar. Our working environments ought to be peculiar. We ought to do, we ought to do marriage in a peculiar way. We ought to do breakups in a peculiar way. You know that if you're a Christian, you shouldn't break up just like the world breaks up. You don't have to destroy or defame somebody's name. You don't have to take it online and let them all know what happened. You don't have to gossip behind their back. You are peculiar. We ought to do singleness in a peculiar way. I'm not bored. You're boring. I'm not dull. You're just not sharp. I am peculiar. I'm standing out. Many times as you step into the truth, society will lie about you. But don't believe the lies of society. You have been called out of the crowd. It's only dead fish that go with the flow. You're different. You're different. I wrote it down this way. This is going to encourage everybody. Be peculiar. Regular is already taken. You are peculiar, and it's not based upon how well you curate your IG feed. It's not how many times you dye your hair. It's not how cool your clothes are. It's not your education status. It's not where you went to school. It's not your job title. You are peculiar because the living God resides inside of you, and he's called you out of the lies, and he's given you the courage and the boldness to withstand what they say about you. You are complete, you are satisfied, you are full in Jesus. He is sufficient, he is supreme in my life. I don't own myself, I've given myself over to Jesus. Don't believe the lies, know your worth, and be peculiar. I wanna give you just two thoughts, really simple message today. I had three, but I'm gonna save uh, the third one for next week. Next week I wanna talk a little bit about trauma, I wanna talk about daddy issues, I wanna talk about heartbreak, I think it's gonna be encouraging for all of us in the room, but before we get there, I want to encourage all of us in this room to set some standards in our marriages, in our relationships, and in our singleness. Why? Because we are peculiar. And just two things about peculiar people. Number one, peculiar people, uh, they always value vision over fantasy. Very important that we understand this, that peculiar people, they value vision over fantasy. Um, Vision is is very, very different from fantasy because uh, vision has determined to face the present frustrations, the the present challenges, and deal with it and transform it and confront it into the picture that God has given you. Fantasy, on the other hand, is all about escapism. It's all about not being in touch with reality. It's all about running from the problems, running from the challenges, If you want to be peculiar, if you want to stand out as a single person in 2022, yo, just get a vision for your life. Like just, you start walking around with vision, man, vision all of a sudden changes things because now you start living from values and you start having values and you start having boundaries and you start having vision for your life before you know it. It's like you get a mission for your life. By the way, if you're married in here and you don't have a mission for your marriage, you're missing it. 
Because marriage wasn't just to make you happy. Marriage was to make you sharp. Marriage was to give you an edge. Marriage was for you to come together because two become better than one and it becomes a brand new creation. You need a mission, but all of that comes from vision. All of that comes from you being willing to say, yo, I have a vision for where I'm headed, for where I'm going. I am peculiar. I don't just go with the flow. God has put something in my heart. I'm not trying to escape from everything. I'm ready to confront it and transform it and change it into the image that God has spoken to me. I'm ready to do the work. I'll put it down this way. Vision loves the future, but it doesn't despise the present. This is important. Because just because I carry vision doesn't mean that I neglect where I am today. That would be called fantasy. Fantasy is about escapism. Fantasy is all about getting out of it and just just being somewhere else and just dreaming of another reality because I don't want to confront the one that I'm in. And whenever it comes to the area of relationships, what so happens to so many people is so many people for different types of reasons, default reasons, They never were given a vision of a healthy relationship. And because they were never given a vision of a healthy relationship, many times their their default in life is they're not able to press towards something. They give up too quick or they don't fight through the tough moments. Maybe you're here today and maybe your story is that you watched two parents get divorced. Or maybe you're here today, maybe you watch two people stay together, but they were miserable every day they were together. Maybe you watched even difficult, more difficult stuff. That Maybe in your house what you watched was verbal abuse. Maybe you even watched physical abuse. Maybe you watched addiction. Maybe you watched codependency. Maybe you watched people quit or run or... I don't know what you watched. Here's what I know, and I've taught this for many, many years. This is important. Because whatever you watch is what you learn. This is why it's so important that we come to God's house and it's so important that we begin to look at God's word because God's word begins to give us a vision. God's word begins to give us a picture of what it was that he designed and what it was that he developed for us. And many of us in this room, we didn't mean to, but we watched something unhealthy and now all we know is something unhealthy. And so if we're not careful, we'll come to church, we'll get goosebumps, we'll raise our hand, we'll say, I wanna follow Jesus, but we won't go further than just making a decision. We actually need discipleship. We actually need training. We actually need to learn God's word. And so what happens is a lot of people, I see it all the time, even in our church, they have the best heart in the entire world and they came here and they do love Jesus, but they're looking for a point of a reference. They're looking for a vision. They're looking for a picture. But many times we have two toxic fantasies that we watched aside from the model we had for us in our home. We watched two other things that have destroyed relationships and have destroyed singlehood. The first thing I would say is that we've watched a whole lot of Disney. God bless Disney, you know, but Disney, I think, is a massive reason why marriage and why relationships struggle so much in America in 2022 is because what we watch is we watched fairy tales. And so we have this picture of fairy tales, and that's what relationships are supposed to look like. I read a quote the other day, yo, life is not a fairy tale. If you lose your shoe at midnight, you're drunk. True. <laughs> I'm not against fairy tales. Those of you who've been a part of our community know I preach hard. But I like fairy tales are cool, but fairy tales lie. Happily ever after. How you know, bro? <laughs> How we really know. <laughs> you know, like you just gave us one scene of a story and it makes us all of a sudden begin to fall in love with a certain scene, but life is a story. A relationship is a story. And if you want to be peculiar, quit learning how to date through Disney. Because the most fundamental thing that fairy tales will always sell us is it will always tell us about a princess that needs to be rescued and a prince charming that's coming to save us. And for a moment, it doesn't really matter the gender. We create codependency codependent relationships left and right because we're looking either to be saved or we're looking to rescue. 
so a lot of people, this is what they go into relationships. It's like, oh my goodness, like you, I want to rescue him. I meet some of you girls like, no, Pastor Rich, he doesn't know Jesus, but I'm telling you what, <laughs> you hit, bless his heart. No, no, he's gonna hurt your heart. He's gonna hurt your heart. Listen, you do not marry someone who needs to be rescued. You marry somebody who's already running after Jesus full force in the mission that God has given them. You pick stocks based upon potential. You pick a spouse based upon patterns. Patterns. Look for a partner, not a patient. That's not even in the book. Because there's people right now that are like, I wish I'd have known this 10 years ago. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's because we don't, we don't know the difference. What's happened is, is that we've lost our peculiarity and we've become regular. We've let the culture lie to us. We've let the culture with soft power tell us the story of our lives. Listen, the story you tell yourself will determine the life that you live. Christians are boring, they wear sweater vests, they're shy, they're afraid, dads are bump on the logs, they don't know how to lead, marriage, whew, marriage, no, bro. Singleness means I'm incomplete, I don't have, it. singleness means I'm, I, I'm dissatisfied, singleness means, what? You got Jesus. Your life is an adventure. Look for a partner, not a patient. Look for a partner, not a patient. I know, but you just don't know him. I know the real him. Okay. Okay. But I've talked to people. Sister, how many times? How many more times is that guy get to cheat on you before we all get to meet the real him? Is it, is it, is it, does he get two more chances? That's, that's heavy. I'm not like, I mean, it can sound so superior. I'm not, that's not what I'm coming to. I'm, I'm trying to get you to go back to know, know your value, know your worth. Don't, don't settle. Don't settle. Could it be that you have a fantasy instead of a vision? Could it be that Disney is discipling you instead of God's word? So one big fantasy is, is this thing called Disney. Here's the other one. I know this is tough stuff, but this goes into our marriage as well. There's two toxic, two toxic fantasies that if whatever we watched at home, if that was broken, if, if that wasn't right, whatever I watched, I learn. So, okay, mom and dad, they weren't there. Dad left. Mom wasn't there. They were present. They weren't engaged. I don't know your story, but it was unhealthy. It was toxic. So now you're looking for references, and what you watch is what you learn. So you watch Disney, and if you didn't watch Disney, at some point, a lot of us, we graduate to this word called porn. And, 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 and porn, just so we understand, <laughs> is one big fantasy. It's all about escapism. And I came at this hard last week, and I'm not trying to, I just, it's hard to talk about relationships. It's hard to talk about singleness and not talk about one of the fastest growing businesses in the world. As far as I'm concerned, I know it's very, very heavy language, but there is incredible studies done on almost every serial killer who's ever stepped into that space. And most of them are all addicted to porn. Some might even say porn is a gateway to murder. Why? Because what we don't know that we're doing soft power is that we're objectifying the body. We're putting low value on the body and we're using other people's body for our pleasure. Oh, it's not a big deal. I don't know them. They don't know me. It's not hurting anybody. No, it is hurting the inside you, the peculiar part of you. I know you look good on the outside. I know you're fly and your Instagram and look at me, but on the inside, you are losing the thing that is making you peculiar. It's hurting you and it's destroying you. And can we just be really, really clear for a moment? Um, sex don't look like that. And this, some of us don't even know that. It's like, yeah, like all we know about sex is like what we saw in pornography and it destroys our intimate, real relationships because before you know it, we turn our spouse into a porn star. 
and they're never ever gonna measure up to the edits and the angles and the lighting, and you're like, this is different. Of course it's different. It's called one is a fantasy and one is reality. I read a study that millennials are having less sex than ever before, and there's many studies that would say it's not because of porn, but I just, I don't really care how much research they bring back to me. Porn is on the rise and sex and millennials is on the decrease. Why? Because one is a false intimacy and it's a counterfeit. It's not what God created. It's what man has made and what man sells to us. And listen to me, what you behold is what you seek to become. So what I watch is what I learn and then what I behold What I feed my flesh is what I seek to become. Newsflash. Personalities are sexy too. But what has porn done to a generation? Porn has made us highlight and focus simply on the flesh and simply on the outside appearance, simply on the surface, and we are missing out on truly what makes somebody peculiar. Don't get me wrong, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You need physical attraction, you need chemistry to make a relationship work. But the lie of culture would try to say that all you need for a relationship is physical attraction and chemistry. Not true. Yo, if the conversation is trash, the sex will never be good enough. I fell in love with Dawn Cherie. Thank God she's beautiful, thank God. I, that's, that's none of your business. And. Um, <laughs> But I'm, I'm grateful that God gave us an entire season that we just fell in love over the phone through conversation. Her personality turns me on more than her body does. That's a good thing too, because how many y'all know? Time is mean to us. <laughs> I just wondered, oh yeah. <laughs> I hear you, brother. <laughs> I wonder if, if we're just regu- regular, the world just goes fantasy over vision, but God's people say, no, 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 no. God, give me vision. God, I want to have a vision for my singleness. I want to have a vision for my marriage. I want to have a vision for my dating relationship. It's giving me a direction. It's putting boundaries. It's helping me go the distance. I don't want to just use people, and I don't want to be used. I don't want to be used. Here's what I know. I know that people, that whenever we buy into fantasies, and and fantasies are not always sexual. Some of us, you go to work every day, and you just have this fantasy about the job that is awesome, you know? That's no work, but but it's a fantasy. It's escapism. It's, It's forcing you to run from what is in front of you, What I love about vision is vision loves the future, but it doesn't despise the present. Instead, it confronts the present. It addresses the frustrations and it walks through it. Listen to me, if you will face the frustration, God will give you grace to walk through it. In fact, I wanna be very, very practical because this is gonna help some marriages for a moment right now. Because you're like, all right, I'm hearing my pastor talk today and I wanna get vision for our marriage. I don't even know where to begin. Here's where you always begin. God gives you frustration as an indication of vision. What I want you to do is I want you to go home and write down your frustrations because every one of those frustration points is actually a key to the vision he's giving you. So listen, if you don't want to yell when you argue, write that down. Now all of a sudden I got vision. We're not going to yell when we argue. We're going to argue, but we're not going to yell at each other. We're we're not going to... We're not gonna sleep outside of the house when we get into an argument. That, that's called vision. Hey, Don sure now we get in some fights, but yo, I don't go sleep at my buddy's house when we have a big argument. I don't even sleep on the couch. It's my bed and it's her bed. It's gonna be like, it's a stalemate. Where are we going? Where are we going? It's my bed, it's my bed. No, it's my bed. All right, we're both gonna sleep here. Sorry for you, you know. You don't wanna be in credit card debt. It's frustration. Now it's vision. I don't want to sit in church alone. Some of you single people, you ought to make this decision right now. I want my spouse to be in God's house with me. I want my kids to be in God's house with me. These frustrations are actually the key to the vision that God is giving us, but we got to write it down like the scripture says. Can you give me that other thought real quick here? There's one right before it, Alex, if you can give it to me. There you go. If you will face the frustrations head on, 
God will give you a vision to carry on. Fantasy is about escaping. Vision is about confronting and transforming the present into the picture God has given you. Where do I get this picture? I get this picture from God's word. I am peculiar. I am not regular. I'm done believing the lies. I know my worth and I am peculiar. Let me just give you one more thought today. The first is simply this, that peculiar people, they value vision over fantasy. Number two, this is a good one. Peculiar people choose wisdom over experience. This is, this, is, this is important because we live in a day and age right now where experience is the truth. Don't, in fact, even right now, this collection, Rich, you can't talk to single people. You're not single. That's not your experience. True. But if we use that logic, then we can't read much of the Bible, can we? Because Paul can't counsel my marriage. He wasn't married. Jesus can't talk to me about divorce. He was, he was single. No, no, no. God's word is wisdom, and it trumps our experience. I want to be a person. This is what it means to be called out of the darkness. This is what it means to be called out of the night and into the light, that I'm actually saying, God, I value your word over my experience. The scripture says, seek First, the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. It's amazing how we, have to, we always go after all these things and then we go after God. Listen, if you don't seek God first, you will always seek God next. Always. Because if you don't go first to him, at some point you're gonna hit rock bottom and he's gonna be the next thing you go to. Just go first, seek first, and all these things. What are all these things? I don't know. Your job, your kids, your relationships, all the things that are in your heart, it all has to be in the right order. It's him first, and then those things follow. This is what faith is. Faith is going, God, I believe your word over my experience. Anyone else out there like me? I do not want a faith that is determined by my experience. I want my experiences to be determined by my faith. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. Experience is not the highest truth. I go, I go throughout my life and I'm like, thank God, you know, like, I, I, this is the only church I've ever pastored and I hope it's the only church I ever do pastor. I don't need a bunch of experiences to lead this one. I've only been married to one woman, praise God. And I plan to only be married to one woman. I don't need another experience. This is where the enemy lies. She's like, this marriage is going bad. You know what I need? I, I'm, just getting, I'm just getting under my belt. I'm gonna experience the next one. Or, or I need this partner. I need that partner. No, 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 no. Get God's wisdom in your situation. Look at what Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10 says. It says this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord. This is not me trembling afraid of God. This is God is righteous. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. And when me, this regular guy, step into his presence, I recognize where the real power is. It's when the disciples are there on the water and Jesus gets up and he speaks out and he tells the ocean, he tells the water, be still. And everything goes still. The scripture says they were terrified in the calm. Why were they terrified? Because they met the storm's match. Your storm is no match for your savior and it requires you to go, you are awesome and you know more than I do and I want your wisdom over my experience. I came across a study that was done in the UK. The Telegraph did a study about deep, long-lasting relationships. And what they decided to do is they decided to work backwards and figure out how many things people had to go through before they landed on a deep relationship. I thought some of the research was interesting. I think you'll find it interesting, not in the book, but good research. The average woman, according to Telegraph, as they did their study, um, she, has, she kisses 15 different people. That's, that's, what, that's what they say. Uh, she has seven different sexual partners, four one-night stands, four disastrous dates. Anyone ever been on a disaster? No, okay, we'll leave that. All right, <laughs> last night, bro. Anyways, um, three relationships that lasted less than a year, two relationships that lasted more than a year, the average woman, she fell in love twice, heartbroken twice, watch this, she cheated once, there's some honesty from the study, <laughs> and the last one, she was, she was cheated on once. That, that's the average woman of what the Telegraph came back with, but then they also did a study on men, and what they found out with men was that uh, the average man, he, he has kisses 16 people, um, 10 sexual partners, six one-night stands, 
four disastrous dates, four relationships that last uh, less than a year, two relationships that last more than a year, uh, falls in love twice, heartbroken twice, he cheats on someone once, and then he's also uh, cheated on once. And when I read all of that, on, on one hand, um, I could preach it and say, you know, be encouraged. Uh, even after all of that, there is a deep, long-lasting relationship on the other side. But I think that that would be the encouragement of the world. The encouragement from God's house is, yo, why do you have to go through all of that before you find one that you can partner with? Why not be peculiar? Why not be peculiar? That's not saying it to shame you. That's saying it to us as a people. Say, we are called out. We don't have to go through all of that to find the right person. We can be peculiar. We can stand out because of God. Wisdom over experience. There's two ways to get wisdom. Lots of ways you can get it, but two ways I wrote down this week. One way is that you get wisdom. This is the real wise people through other people's failures. Learn. <laughs> Your story, God's word, this is through other people. This is through God's word. This is, this is the wisest people, in my opinion. But most of us, we're not that wise. Most of us, we have to get wisdom, what? Through our own failure. And I think oftentimes, as I mature in the Lord, what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to get a revelation before I hit rock bottom. But if we're not careful, we'll just always go till rock bottom before we gain wisdom. Maybe you're here today and you are dealing with a failure and I want to encourage you. Scripture says the righteous man, he falls seven times, but he gets back up. This is the beauty of God's grace. This is the beauty of what Jesus did for us, that he reaches his hand down as we begin to sink in the water and says, get back up. You can continue to walk on water with me. The value of failure is learning. And the value of learning is improvement. That I'm improving, that I'm, I'm growing, that I'm becoming. I, I want us to be a church that we operate in wisdom. I don't need to experience everything for something to be true. I can trust God at his word. And one of the most peculiar stories in the Bible, I'm not sure if I've ever preached on it. I was trying to go through my notes and see if I've ever preached on it before, but it's this Old Testament story. And I love looking at the Old Testament scriptures and bringing relevant, applicable truths for us today. But the wisest man in all the Bible, and really most philosophers would even agree, the wisest man to ever live was this guy named Solomon. He wrote some books in the Bible, one of which is the book of Proverbs. But Solomon was the son of David, who was the king of Israel. And Solomon went and did incredible things in the nation of Israel. But um, in all of Solomon's wisdom, he had massive failures, of course. You can read about those in the scripture. But there's these different accounts where he would behave with such wisdom that people would marvel at him. You see, Solomon, when he was getting ready to become the king of Israel, God said, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. And the only thing that Solomon asked for, he says, God, give me wisdom. What I love about Solomon's request is that his request wasn't just for wisdom. His request was attached to people. He said, God, give me wisdom that I might lead your people. Why? Because people are always at the heart of God. You are in God's heart. God cares about you. God values you. God thinks you are valuable. In fact, how valuable does he think you are? He actually paid Jesus to purchase you. All people, all people, you are at the heart of God. So Solomon says, give me wisdom that I might lead your people. And God says, I'm going to give you wisdom. And he begins to write things and does things. But one of the most peculiar accounts of Solomon that I find in the scripture is there's this story in 2 Kings chapter three where there's these two prostitutes. It's a very bizarre story, but both of them had become pregnant and both of them gave birth. In fact, they gave birth three days apart from each other. And what happened was, was one night while they were sleeping, one of the prostitutes, she, she laid on her baby and her baby died in the sleep. And so she was sly. She got up from the night and she went and took the other prostitute's baby, put the dead baby with that mother and then took the live baby and brought her to herself. The morning when they woke up, the mom whose child did not die said, yo, you switched our babies. You gotta read the Bible. It is better than any soap opera. Trust me, it's real drama. 
And now they have this whole quarrel. It's like this, no, 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 like the dead baby's yours. No, the dead baby's not mine. It, it, that, that's my baby. And so it gets brought to Solomon. So like they're fighting over it. And Solomon does a very unusual thing. The scripture says, I'm gonna pick it up. Second Kings chapter three, verse 24. After he hears their entire account. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king. And the king said, divide. Everyone say divide. Divide the living child in two. So he's saying, bring my sword. We're gonna cut this baby in half. This guy's wise. Let's read the story. And give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, oh my Lord, give her the living child and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours, divide him. This woman, my goodness. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman and by no means put him to death. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered. And they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. It's a peculiar story, but I think it's one that lands well today. That here's this living baby brought and Solomon says, bring me my sword. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to cut the baby in half. I'm gonna divide the baby. And whatever mother actually shows sorrow over this will be the indication that she is the real mom. And whatever mom is happy about this, well, yo, even if you are the real mom, you a bad woman, you know? And I'm always reminded that when it comes to the culture that we're in, that all of us have to bring out our sword and we have to decide how many of y'all know, when I decide, I divide. When I decide and I take my sword, I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is my truth. And I'm going to obey this truth. And I know as I make this decision, it's going to cause division. That people will lie about me. People will mock me. People will betray me. People will not understand me. But it's in my decision that I am not just bringing division towards the culture, but rather I am bringing division against the enemy and his plans towards me. Because no longer can I be swayed by my urges and by my feelings. No longer can I be swayed by the moment. No longer can I be swayed by the crowd. No longer can I be swayed by peer pressure. But I have decided that my experience, it lies to even me. I am a person of faith and I have been called out of darkness. And I am drawing a line in the sand. I'm deciding in order to divide the enemy. This is is my truth. This This is my truth. And when I operate in truth, wisdom comes into my life. Wisdom comes into my life. And when I have wisdom, oh man, before you know it, I start stepping into what God has planned for me. I'm not always understood. At times, I'm, I'm mocked with as the preacher in the sweater vest, but that's okay. I know what makes me different. It's not what you see on the outside. It's what's going on on the inside. And in our churches today and in this collection of single and secure, we've just got to be reminded that you can't be the bride of Christ and date the world at the same time. You can't. You gotta you gotta choose. You gotta pull your sword out. That's what the word of God is. It's a it's a sword of the spirit. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it brings truth to our situation. Here's the truth today. God loves you. God has a plan for you. And God says, trust me and follow me. Don't go with the flow. Come out of the crowd. I saved you for a purpose. Be peculiar. You're different. You're unusual. Walk into your office tomorrow. I don't care what your title is. I'm peculiar. Get back into your minivan after church today and look at your wife and say, we're peculiar. Look at your kids. Get them around the dinner table and say, I want to let you know, kids. We are a peculiar family. We don't look like everybody else. And guess what? That's how God designed it. Come on, do you believe that today? 
I'm going to give God some praise.